I want to talk to you about the impact that compassion can have on breaking the silence of domestic abuse. What is domestic abuse? The Domestic Abuse Act 2021 defines domestic abuse as consisting of any of the following. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, threatening and violent behaviour, controlling and coercive behaviour, economic abuse, psychological, emotional or other abuse, where the victim and the perpetrator are aged 16 years or more and they are personally connected. It could be a one-off instance or a course of action over time. I want to share some statistics with you. In 2022, the Office of National Statistics posted that one in five people will experience domestic abuse in their lifetime, which equates to one in three to four women, one in six to seven men. Out of every three victims, two are female, one is male. In the year ending March 2022, police reported over one and a half million incidents of domestic abuse related crime, which was 7.7% up from the year before. But domestic abuse is a hidden crime which goes largely unreported. Only 24% of domestic abuse related incidents are actually reported. The social and economic cost to the UK economy is a whopping £66 billion pounds, as reported by the Home Office in 2019. £14 billion pounds of that is a cost of businesses through lost productivity and people taking time off work due to domestic abuse. It's estimated that 30 women every week in England and Wales will try to attempt suicide as a result of domestic abuse. And three women every week will take their own lives. Now, I don't know whether you are aware of those figures. I certainly wasn't until I did the research. Domestic abuse is a, domestic abuse is a taboo subject that's not talked about. Why are we not owning up to domestic abuse, given these shocking statistics? There are a number of reasons. Shame, guilt, fear of the perpetrator, I believe it's embedded into our culture. Like many children, when I was little, age four or five, I used to love listening to fairy stories, fairy tales, you know, that starts once upon a time. I love the story of Cinderella. But how sad that her mother dies. And how awful she has to live this life of servitude with her stepmother and the two ugly daughters, sisters. But then she gets visited by the fairy godmother and she did get to go to the ball. And she gets to meet the gorgeous Prince Charming, who finally rescues her from a life of domestic abuse. And how about Bluebeard, who murdered his wives because they were disobedient? We have Sleeping Beauty, the baby princess is cursed through a fit of Joe's rage on the Queen. But did you know that the original story of Sleeping Beauty was actually published in 1634? And in that original version, our princess was not woken by her true love. She was found deeply asleep lying on the bed by the King who repeatedly raped her. And then we have Rumpelstiltskin, that little imp, who spins gold for our heroine, who might think he's a good guy. He tries to control her by insisting that she give him her firstborn child. Who knows what he would have done with that baby if he hadn't, she hadn't figured out what his name was. So many of these fairy stories that are part of our popular history, our common popular history, our, our um, mythology, if you like, that are embedded in our subconscious minds are actually stories of domestic and child abuse. So maybe it's possibly not so abnormal, if you like, that we should think of domestic abuse as acceptable since we were fed these stories at a very early age. My mother used to love telling stories, sharing stories. She would start them when I was a girl. So I learned a lot through her anecdotes that she shared with us. I found out that my kindly grandfather was not such a 
nice father to my mother and her three sisters. He was born in 1901, very Victorian time. He wanted a boy so he could pass his business on to a boy. I found out that he wasn't a very nice husband to my grandmother. My grandmother was very intelligent. She was one of the first to go to Girton College in Cambridge and did a chemistry degree. When she married my grandfather, she wasn't allowed to work. But my mother said how she, one of the things she had to do was report to my grandfather with the accounts for the week so that he could see where she'd spent the money. My three aunts all married controlling men. My mother escaped the family home by getting pregnant at age 18. She was disinherited by my grandfather because she refused to give her baby up for adoption. My mother obviously married this man, who turned out to be hyper-controlling and violent. And she finally managed to escape from him when I was just two years old and my younger sister was still a baby in arms. I remember saying to my mother, did you want to have five daughters? And she said, I don't know, really. you just kept coming along. I found out my dad was a very violent, abusive man. He kept my mother pregnant so he could control her. She had five babies in seven years, and miscarriages in between when he pushed her down the stairs. He would hit her, rape her. She was terrified that he would harm us. In those days, a woman could not get her hands on contraception without the signed, written consent of her husband. And in those days, police would not intervene in a domestic because a man was considered the head of the household and could do whatever he chose. So domestic abuse was not spoken about and therefore by association it was considered normal, acceptable. When I was seven years old, my mother remarried. My stepfather turned out to be a bit like Cinderella's stepmother, a bit of a hard taskmaster. He would hit us and beat us with a stick or his belt for whatever reason. And we were forbidden from talking about it outside our house. It's like this shroud of secrecy. And I remember, fascinated, watching my elder sister. She seemed to copy some of the, shall we say, not so helpful life choices that my mother had made. She met and married, you got it, a controlling man. Turned out to be violent. She had three children with him. When they were very small, she became concerned about their safety. So with my mother's help, she got away from him. But then she had more relationships with other controlling people until she married one. And she died five years later, and she told me that she really felt that her cancer had been triggered by the toxic relationship she had with that man. Now, it's not inevitable, but it is very common and understandable that children follow the pathways of their parents. We're very heavily influenced by the environment that we grow up in, programmed even, and by the behaviours of our role models, our parents and carers. So it's not unusual that a child should grow up to become a victim of domestic abuse. And it's not unusual that a child should grow up to become a perpetrator of domestic abuse. They all need our help. My mother died in 2019, and when she died, I was reflecting on her life, and I realised how courageous she'd been to have got us away from that man. In those days when there was no support, police weren't interested. She did that. How courageous. She was a very self-effacing woman, very kind and compassionate. She loved to tell stories, and I decided I would turn her story into a novel, which I did. When I created that story and shared it, it changed my life. People read my book and they came to me and wanted to share their story. Literally, hundreds of people came to me and shared their story. I was shocked, not by the stories, although they were pretty scary sometimes, pretty horrendous. I learned about all the many guises of domestic abuse. Parental alienation, coercive control, forced marriage, strangulation, gaslighting, manipulation, all of these things, silent treatment, the works. That's not what shocked me though. What shocked me was the prevalence. The prevalence and the fact that nobody talks about it. 
I, uh, I went to a, a bookshop owner, I contacted a bookshop owner and asked if she would host a book signing event for my book to help me promote my book. She uh, must have gone away and looked through Amazon, flicked through the first few pages like you do. And she came back and she said, congratulations on becoming a published author. But I don't think your book is for our readers. So I'm not sure, maybe my book triggered something for her. Her reaction triggered something for me. It was like a, a lightning flash. I decided I was going to put on a conference called Let's Talk Domestic Abuse, which I did. I invited speakers and survivors and other people, and we shared stories, and it was such a powerful event. That's how humans connect, really connect, by sharing stories on an emotional level. That's how we connect. And I do believe that by listening to other people's stories with compassion, that we connect even more. Maybe their stories are the same as ours, maybe they're different, but that's how we really connect. And I believe that we need to connect more than ever right now. Domestic abuse is rife. It is everywhere. It's not declining, it's increasing. Why are we not calling it out? One of the horrible facts is that one in five people experience domestic abuse. What does that really mean? It means that one in five people are perpetrators of domestic abuse. One in five people are perpetrators of domestic abuse. So it's no wonder that so much science, because so many people are doing this horrible crime, and it, at least it is officially a crime now. But with so few cases reported and so few of those getting to courts, we still have a long way to go. We need to make it okay for people experiencing domestic abuse to reach out and share their stories, just like we have done with previous taboo subjects, like suicide, mental health, AIDS, menopause, we need to make it okay to talk about it. Otherwise, by staying silent, we make it seem that it's acceptable and normal. Not only are people suffering because of domestic abuse, whole households are suffering misery where domestic abuse is taking place. Not only that, it filters down into the workplace. Remember, domestic abuse costs businesses £14 billion pounds a year through time taken off. A client said to me, she was really concerned, one of her team was coming in late, was making lots of mistakes, customers were complaining. It wasn't like her. She knew she'd been in an abusive marriage, but she got out of that. I suggested she have a chat. Ask her, is everything okay at home? So she did, and her team member opened up and shared she realised she'd gone straight from an abusive marriage into a controlling relationship that had turned violent. And now she was afraid for the safety of her two kids and herself. I gave her the details of a local domestic abuse service, which she passed on to her team member. Now she's getting the help she needs. What can we all do? Four things. One, show compassion. We need to be ready willing and able to lend a compassionate ear to people we notice are struggling. They may be too afraid to say anything. They may be experiencing shame, guilt, any other negative emotion to keep them silent. Unless you are a trained domestic abuse professional, avoid trying to fix the problem yourself. Just get the details of local domestic abuse services and share them, pass them on. Number two, misogyny and sexism underpin domestic abuse. We need to be challenging and forbidding sexist banter and being exemplary role models. Number three, if you are a domestic abuse perpetrator, get help. There are organisations and professionals that are fully trained in this, get help. And finally, 
Choose wisely the stories that you pass down to your children. Domestic abuse needs to be named for what it is. It's only by raising awareness and communicating with compassion that we can do anything significant about this. Let's break the silence of domestic abuse and stop handing down to our children. 